music and the brain, how and why it impacts on child learning and its context in our education. Let's first look at some of the stats behind the organ that controls your very life force and through which you interpret the world about you. A typical galaxy will have a hundred million stars. Your brain has a hundred billion brain cells. Those brain cells compute a hundred trillion calculations every second. And your brain has a hundred billion megabytes of memory. For a series of standard Intel processors to carry out the work of the brain, they would need the cooling capacity of the entire output of Niagara Falls directed on them. And the human brain is alone as a processor and being able to carry out millions of functions simultaneously. Broadly speaking, the brain is divided into left and right functions. And miraculously, it's 70% water. Your brain seeks rewards for adaptive behaviour. Adaptive behaviour is the ability for us to respond to the changes happening around and to us and to change our behaviour accordingly. The brain will reward itself for adaptive behaviour by releasing several different neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters give us our sense of well-being or trust or love, dependent on the situation and the stimulus. This adaptive behaviour is what permits our continuous development. The more we engage the brain in pursuits that end positively, the more it will respond positively to any learning process. The more we impact negatively, the more it will resist. This may sound obvious, but once we think of behaviour in terms of distinct electrochemical activity, it becomes easier to accept cause and effect in teaching and learning, and the inevitable consequence of blanket negativity. Positive teaching creates learning, improves self-esteem and confidence. Negative teaching alters behaviour. Understanding how the brain receives new learning is fundamental to the way we teach. It's where cognitive psychology and neuroscience meet, and they've been likened to the software and hardware of a computer. This is a simplistic analogy and open to philosophic debate, because the brain is a far more powerful organ than any computer, and organically controls its own software in ways that we've yet to establish, let alone emulate. It's the most complex organ in the known universe, in 1985, John Sloboda wrote his seminal work, Cognitive Psychology of the Musical Mind, and this was his summation of children's learning of music. So where does music come in specifically? Music has for centuries been considered an aesthetic art, added on to our cognitive capabilities as we developed, until recently. In 1997, Professor Steven Pinker threw down a challenge by suggesting that music was auditory cheesecake and simply an adaptation of language skills. The use of MRI on minds actively listening to music was to start a process of investigation to challenge that opinion. And we're still exploring this most exciting area where science and art meet. As a result of many years of serious study and rigorous research, Professor Michael H. Thought author of the research paper Rhythm, Music and the Brain concluded Music has a specific brain architecture associated with specific behaviours and responses. Sensitivity to music and spontaneous musical expression begin early in life without conscious effort or directed learning. He further asked the question Is music a perceptual template for order in time that helps to shape all aspects of cognitive, affective and motor functions. In other words, do we need music for everything we do? It would be Santiago Ramón e Cajal who would first discover brain plasticity. This was in 1904 and he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work. Ironically, as a young boy, he'd wanted to be an artist, but his father made him study medicine. He combined his talents for both with some exceptional artwork on nerve mapping, bringing his left and right brains together. It was this man that first suggested that the brain could adapt itself and form new neural links to accommodate new skills and learning. As a trained musician develops, several areas of the brain respond by increasing activity and size to meet the demands placed upon them. The earlier that musical training begins, the easier that development is to achieve. 
There are plenty of spare neurons kicking around at that time. Music is proven to develop all parts of the brain that are engaged in it. Let's look at some of those parts. The eardrum and cochlea. They're our auditory connection with the outside world. The microphone that picks up sounds and converts it into frequencies that feed straight into the auditory cortex. The mixer. Whatever frequencies it hears, it will copy and fire off to the different centers of the brain. Temporal lobes. Dedicated auditory receptive and association areas make the connection for express behavior, receptive speech, and information retrieval from other parts of the memory. They live on both sides of the brain and can identify the timbre of the sound and refer to the hippocampus for the memory of the sound, which in turn accesses the mental dictionary found at the junction between the temporal, occipital and parietal lobes, so you can sing along or pass comment on what you're hearing or playing. And as the brain identifies and processes pitch sequences, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and Brodmann areas 44 and 47 are brought into play with a whole new set of neurons firing off to analyze the language and to manage the comprehension processes furthering the input to the temporal lobes. The cerebellum meantime is making its own way dealing with the rhythm, meter and tempo of the music. It's also responsible for automotor functions so it's here that the automatic patterns to create the perfect chord or play the necessary fingering on the flute or sax come from and are fed directly into the motor cortex. This controls the movements we make and the way we make them. Further on and more intense in the emotion stakes comes the prefrontal cortex, the philosopher of our brain. This creates the expectation of what we're listening to or playing and decides whether the sense is satisfied or violated. The amygdala, often referred to as the swami of the brain, alleged to have powers of ESP, but more likely to be associated with memory and fear complexes. It sifts through the signals to further trigger reward hormones. The nucleus accumbens is our emotional barometer, forcing us to tears or laughter, or even fear, dependent on the association we're given to the music. And the corpus callosum, through all of this activity, is passing the hundreds of millions of signals necessary to keep those different hemispheres of the brain stocked with the information it needs for processing that piece of music. It's this part that can grow by up to 50% in a trained musician. So what happens in your brain when you sit and listen to your favorite piece of music? As the music plays, our brain builds up an expectation of what is coming next and responds to this positive learning. It rewards itself for getting it right by emitting pleasant neurotransmitters. If the music changes in an unexpected way, but still within the parameters of acceptability, the brain responds positively as being challenged and will still continue to attempt prediction and reward itself. In listening to a piece of music, we are in fact learning it, and that melody and the pulse of it will be recorded with phenomenal accuracy within the core structures of our brain, in a way that can be instantly retrieved in the future. The brain will also, in ways we do not yet understand, attach emotional values that we may have developed while listening. This then is what music can do, in all respects, music can and should be an integral and positive part of our teaching and learning. Whether it's learning the alphabet by rhyme or simultaneous equations by rapping, music can make us better teachers and, as learners, able to be more receptive. Attaching music positively to all of our learning activities improves the left and right functions of the brain, improves memory and attaches emotional significance to what we're trying to remember making it easier to recall the memory accurately when we need it. If we're taught in a way that the brain perceives as negative, it is thought likely that the association will remain a negative one within the memory and affect how we respond to that learning in the future. Learning to sing or play a musical instrument needs to be a fundamental part of education. Evidence points to the probability that music was once the domain of every individual and that by creating specialists and establishing it as an art and separating it out from day-to-day -day practical maths and science-based activities is not only wrong, but denies a fundamental need of mankind to make his or her own music. Everyone is musical inside. There can no longer be a mind and a brain treated separately. We have to know about both because they work together in perfect synchronous harmony. 
there can no longer be an art and a science. When Leonardo invented the helicopter, that was science followed by art. When Einstein restructured our universe, that was art followed by science. It's often been said that in every generation there are breakthroughs that change the way humanity develops. This is our opportunity to change the education of children, and you are part of it. History will say that the starting point was in the new millennium, and that during this time music was discovered to be much more than auditory cheesecake. It is in fact what makes us human.